right, hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of the American Health Law Association's Speaking of Health Law podcast. My name is Maggie Martin, and I am joined today by um, Hala Mustafar and Chris Edelman. Hi, Chris. Hi, Hala. Hi. Hello. We will go around and introduce ourselves briefly and then move on to our topic for today. So I am Maggie Martin. I am a director in the Oklahoma City office of Crow and Dunleavy. I have a healthcare regulatory and transactional practice here in Oklahoma, representing healthcare systems, hospitals, and physicians on numerous matters, but particularly on medical staff and physician discipline matters, which is our topic for today. Um, hi, I'm Hala. Uh, I'm an associate at Horty Springer Manor. Uh, so we're a boutique health law firm based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but we have clients in all 50 states. Uh, we work primarily as outside counsel for hospitals to assist in just a wide range of things from creating and updating medical staff governance documents to litigation to issues that arise during the course of daily operations. Uh, as a relatively new attorney, I get the, an opportunity to be involved in a little bit of every aspect of our practice. So I don't have a particular specialty in anything just yet, but I'm excited to be here with you both today and talk about this really cool area of options for medical staff leaders. My name is Chris Adelman. I am a shareholder with Hall Render in the Denver office, and we are a firm uh, solely dedicated to the healthcare industry. My practice really focuses as uh, outside general counsel to hospitals uh, of varying sizes with a focus on the medical staff aspect and compliance. I've been practicing 18 years and I am happy to be here with you today. Great, looking forward to our conversation today. I think this is gonna be great. So our topic is informal resolutions in physician discipline. Essentially, we're gonna be discussing what is an informal resolution process? How does it look? What are the legal considerations for an informal resolution process? And then give you kind of a checklist or some tips to consider when implementing informal resolution with your clients. So let's just go ahead and dig in guys. Um, I think kind of the first question is what is an informal resolution process? What kind of uh, informal resolutions do we often see or how does that process look? Do either one of you wanna kick us off? I'm happy to. Um, it is what, what it sounds like. It's a, <laughs> an informal process, but, but not too informal on addressing issues that arise um, before they become significant uh, to try to address them in a manner that is not as contentious. Uh, we need to remember here, we're talking about physicians and practitioners privileges, which is their livelihood. And when uh, these issues escalate and adverse action is taken against a, a practitioner's privileges, um, it, it can have a, a significant impact on their career. And so we like to try to address these issues before they escalate and they become too contentious and you know everyone lawyers up and, and it makes it harder to address these problems. Yeah, I think these uh, informal resolutions are really aimed, like Chris said, at early detection and also that voluntary resolution of problems. So you really want the physician to be on board before things get too far. Yes, I agree. I usually see these as kind of a first step to addressing some physician behavior that you kind of foresee becoming um, more difficult or more problematic in the future and kind of try to um, prevent things from rising to the level of maybe becoming more of a peer review action or something that affects the physician's privileges in the future. Um, I also often see um, a lot of my clients use some sort of informal resolution process to deal with maybe um, more behavioral issues, um, issues, uh, maybe some anger management issues or um, disruptive staff issues, things of that matter. Have you guys kind of seen those, this process used for issues like that as well? I think it's, it's a, a great process for behavioral issues. Um, mm -hmm. Often the behavioral issues start small and then escalate, um, especially if they go unaddressed. And I think a, another thing to pay attention to is that items that are good to address through the informal resolution process are items that sometimes would be ignored otherwise. And when you ignore these items, sometimes you're enabling a practitioner uh, 
or reinforcing that behavior. So trying to address them early is a good idea. Uh, it is a very a good tool for behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. I think it's good for behavioral. Um, I have seen it in some instances where it is used to address some like minor clinical issues. Uh, so I had one instance where there was a physician that was straight out of residency, had taken a little gap in what they were doing, and then they decided to go back into medicine. And when they got back, they weren't like solely up to the standard that the hospital wanted. And the hospital got to use that, like a, an informal resolution, send them for some additional remedial training. Um, so that was a nice little way to keep a uh, physician on staff that they really liked, but just needed a little bit more. And it didn't need to escalate to some formal review process. Yeah, I think that sounds like a great way to handle issues similar to that. Yeah. Chris, were you going to say something? Well, I just think it, you know, also good for uh, items such as documentation, maybe timeliness, completion of records, uh, that's quasi uh, clinical and behavioral kind of combined. Uh, it's, it's a good tool for those sort of issues as well. Yes, I have seen it used often when a physician is behind on their charting and really needs to get caught up on um, timeliness of charting and, and more administrative matters as well, um, such as maybe just basic record keeping in the office, uh, especially fit physicians in clinics where they can get behind on that type of record keeping. Agreed. And when you're looking at kind of these informal resolutions, do you see this typically happening with the administration, more so the medical staff, such as a chief of staff or a chief medical officer? How have you typically seen this happen in your, with your clients? You know, I think some of it depends on the avenue you, you want to go. And, and when the hospital uh, has identified an issue, um, you know, you as we'll continue to talk later about the concept of an employed physician or an independent physician. I think you have a, a path to pick on, are you going to address it through the administration or are you going to go through the medical staff? Um, and there's considerations for both. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the nature of the problem probably dictates which route you go. I, I agree with that. And I think the type of informal resolution that you choose to take also would determine which route you want to go. So something like a, a meeting maybe would be better with some medical staff leaders, not so much administration, um, stuff like that. Yeah, I would agree as well, especially as we'll talk, like Chris said, as we'll talk later about employed physicians, I've seen um, some effective methods of dealing with more so the medical staff to resolve these things informally um, for certain issues. And then other, and at, a, at other times, it's better to go through the administration or maybe even an HR leader to deal with some of these matters more so through the employment route. And I would say whichever route you pick, having uh a dedicated individual or an identified individual who understands the process and knows how to apply it is very good. Uh, if you just let anyone jump in for the informal resolution process, oftentimes um, it can deviate from a nice, uh, well thought out process and you might not end up with the protections or the results you want. Yes, I agree. I think having a well-written policy or drafted policy around how to handle disruptive physician behavior in, in an informal resolution process, whether that be a separate policy and procedure applicable to the medical staff or set out in the bylaws, I think is something very important so that everyone involved knows what, what is the path forward, who's responsible for addressing these matters. Um, if someone has a complaint or an issue, who do they bring it to? Do they just talk to anybody or how is that elevated through the chain of command um, and, and who should be addressing that issue? So our next kind of uh, item we wanted to consider is what are some of the legal considerations for an informal resolution process? I think one of the main questions that, you know, we often get and something that I know our, our audience is curious about is when you're dealing with these, what would be considered privileged or confidential? Can you maintain any sort of confidentiality around um, the conversations, the records that may be generated from these informal uh, processes? You certainly can. I think this comes back to what you were discussing before of having well-written policies, uh, medical staff bylaws that identify an informal resolution process 
and set forth the procedure that you will follow when you're in that process and also bringing it under the veil of peer review. It is a peer review process and you know, peer review doesn't have to be only adverse action. Uh, there's a lot of remedial steps that we'd like to see before we get there. And so uh, if you if you have well-written bylaws that identify the process that bring it into the peer review process, you follow that, you're gonna have a lot better chance of having some peer review protection uh, and HICWA immunity. Um, so I think it's very important to have that, have that set out in writing. Yeah, and I think uh, you know every state has their own peer review statute, so I don't think it can be overstated enough that it's good to check back with that statute and then how the courts have interpreted to see that everything you're creating is covered and make sure that you're handling everything correctly, especially with some recent court opinions that have kind of blown some peer review protection in some areas and then in other states has kind of helped it out. So it's really important to check that to make sure that you're following your own state's guidelines and don't ruin it for yourself. Yeah, I definitely agree. I know here in Oklahoma, we have a, a bit of a broader definition of peer review process and what is peer review information such that we could probably try to get a lot of the um, records or information involved in these informal processes covered under the peer review privilege in our state. Um, I have found it interesting. I have seen a number of kind of plaintiff's attorneys attempting to kind of do away with some state peer review protections, mainly around negligent credentialing cases. So I think there's some potential battles out there to kind of redefine or reconsider what is peer review on a state level. And so I think as you're dealing with this, always make sure you check back into your own state's laws um, to ensure that, you know, you're complying with what is required under those peer review statutes to keep this information confidential or privileged um, and, and keep up to date with the current um, case law that is out there regarding these statutes, because I think there's consistent change and um, ongoing activity in these areas. Have you guys seen that in some of the states you, you uh, practice in? Yeah, I think uh, dealing with because we have clients all over, so I get a little bit of a little bit of taste of everything. And you'll see some states where the protection is pretty broad, and you can advise the hospital to do you know anything's really covered under that. But there's some states where the who can get the information, how far it can spread, is very well defined, and the courts have kept it very narrow. So when sometimes when you're doing stuff, you don't want to you don't want to have too much of a paper trail of things and you want to keep things conversational, not down to writing. So I think it really varies. Yeah. I think both of you are highlighting the importance of knowing your state law, knowing where mm -hmm. your facility is. And again, it goes back to having that documented process that stays within those guidelines. And it is always changing. Certainly plaintiff's bar is uh, we see in all states, I think uh, always trying to chip away at that peer review protection. Right. And so let's talk a little bit about reportability, what could be reportable, um, especially to the National Practitioner Data Bank. Have you, um, what has been your experience in this area? I think at a, at a high level, if you're not taking adverse action, uh, you're, you're not reporting to the data bank. Um, but uh, again, state law does apply here. And, uh, you know, the medical boards in different states have requirements that their physicians, uh, as an example, might be required to report other impaired physicians. And so when you, you know, if, you, if we're dealing with the informal resolution process for maybe a, a, a substance abuse impairment or uh, maybe a DUI or something along those lines, um, it's possible that there's a state reporting requirement that is separate than a national practitioner data bank requirement. And so uh, understanding, again, where you are is very important. But I think if you're, if you're stopping shy of adverse action, you are more likely than not, you are not going to report to the national practitioner data bank. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, unless you have that um, adverse action for longer than 30 days, i we, this is a great process to use so that you don't have to report. Many of my clients don't want to be reporting to the National Practitioner Data Bank um, if they don't have to. And so they like to use these processes to kind of 
address issues before they become such that they rise to the level of, you know, affecting a practitioner's privileges. And I have seen um, cases, though, where the behavior is considered unprofessional conduct in the state. And so there's oftentimes a report that may need to be made, though, to the state licensure board, um, depending on the state statutes. Yeah, I see the same thing. You know, nobody wants to report to the National Practitioner Data Bank and no one wants to get reported to them. So this is a great tool for everybody, I think. Agreed. And yeah, that's why I think we see a lot of the informal resolution is a voluntary process. The physicians agreeing to these things. And I think being able to clearly explain the, the downside of not being voluntary to a physician helps to get them to agree. Agreed. And so when we're dealing with employed physicians, now I know, depending on your state's corporate practice of medicine laws, or maybe other restrictions, you may not typically be employing physicians. But for those that are, what are some considerations you guys have considered um, as you deal with employed physicians or even independent contractors? I think um, one of the biggest considerations with an employed physician, or one way to look at it is, when you have an issue, a uh, behavioral issue, a clinical issue, you almost get two bites at the apple where you have a choice here. Do you go the employment route? You know, there might be an employment contract or policies that are in place and you go through the HR process typically, uh, maybe compliance sometimes, or do you go the medical staff route? And I think one big consideration is what protections are you giving up if you go through the HR process? Typically, those actions uh, and, and the documentation is not protected and is discoverable. Um, and so you need to consider, is that an issue? Is it gonna be an issue moving forward? I think on the flip side, you know, we see some medical staffs that just don't quite hold their colleagues accountable the same as a administration might want to. And so really striking that balance uh, is, is somewhat delicate, um, but I think you do have a, you know, it's something to consider. You have the HR path when they are employed. I see the same thing as Chris. Well, I think while HR is an option, I think a lot of hospitals tend to gear away from it just because it's not as defined in their bylaw, like as you have options in the bylaws, things are a little bit smoother through there. And I think politically too, when HR is telling a physician practitioner what to do, it comes across differently than when their colleagues are telling them what to do. And I have seen that it, it, it's received a little better when your peer is telling you, look, here's the, here's the expectation and you're failing to meet it. Here's what you can do to meet it is different than the HR director who you know, typically is not a practitioner uh, and wasn't ever a practitioner. Yeah, I agree. I've seen it. I've seen disciplinary processes go over better when you have uh, practitioner to practitioner conversation, it tends to be better. However, I have seen medical staffs that are hesitant to discipline when maybe they should. And sometimes that HR process can be helpful um, to avoid maybe an EEOC charge if you have a practitioner who's particularly, um, maybe his behavior is harassment or it creates kind of a violent workplace or a disruptive workplace. You do want to make sure that you're addressing that appropriately so that you don't kind of bring on those potential EEOC claims from other employees who are the subject or the, you know, the victim of the potential harassment or, you know, whatever behavior the physician is exhibiting. Absolutely. And, and I think in those circumstances, sometimes you have parallel paths. You have the medical staff mm -hmm. taking action and you have the hospital administration through their HR department uh, taking action. Yeah, I've seen that too, where HR takes action and wants to terminate under the employment agreement, but yet that doesn't trigger any sort of termination of medical staff privileges. And then so the medical staff is looking at the option of, well, how do we address this from through the bylaws and the, and the disciplinary processes set forth there? And without getting too far off track, if you're lucky enough that in your employment agreement to have a automatic relinquishment of privileges upon termination of the contract, that is, that is a nice savings clause where you can take action, have a physician leave the medical staff without having uh, triggered a fair hearing or any sort of uh, medical staff 
uh, action. Oh, I agree, Chris, and I don't think that's off track at all because it's something I always recommend to my clients is, okay, how can we modify your bylaws or look at your employment agreement templates to ensure that there's language in there that allows you to um, have coterminous um, privileges with the termination of the employment agreement? And I think typically when, when that happens, when the privileges terminate through the employment agreement, we typically don't consider that a adverse action and it doesn't end up being reportable. Correct. Agreed. It would be considered an automatic relinquishment. All right. So as we uh, are looking at informal resolution processes, what are kind of some things that you guys would recommend for um, uh, clients to maybe check off or other attorneys to consider as they're advising their clients on these matters? I, I think a, the big important thing about all the informal resolutions is the importance of documenting every step, even those conversations in the hallway uh, or a coffee meeting with this CMO or something like that to follow it up with a letter so you have in writing something that happened. Uh, we have clients that do a great job of this, so they contact us because things have escalated past that informal resolution. Um, and they'll send us a Word document. It just has the date of things, the concern raised and how they addressed it and any documentation they have of that. And I think stuff like that is really helpful to set yourself up if you have to get to that formal resolution process. So have things, a process in place that is preparing you for the formal resolution process. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Well-written bylaws that identify the process, bring it in under the peer review veil, and then even the use of maybe some template uh, letters or follow-up reports when these meetings and these encounters do take place that are trying to help continue to establish that this was a peer review action, that this was part of the bylaws, uh, really that consistency you know, is very helpful. Uh, oftentimes you will have the, the action in the meeting take place and then months or years later, you're trying to assert a privilege. And so having that documented and not having to recreate what happened, is, are these people still in the organization? Uh, it, it really does lend some credibility to the concept that yes, this was peer review. Here is our process. We follow it every time. I agree with both of you, yes, and um, utilizing policies and procedures that can kind of facilitate um, the reporting of these matters and, and identifying which uh, leader or individual in the facility or the medical staff addresses these or can be very helpful as well. And training those, those people who are going to be involved in the process uh, to, to understand what it is and I mean, we not to, not to be self-serving, but check with legal. You want to be sure there are changes in the law. There is a process that it, that can take place where you are more likely to obtain a privilege uh, than not. And so, really, being knowledgeable about what your bylaws say, what the state law says, what the federal law says, is very helpful. Agreed. Legal should be the first call. All right. Any other last thoughts before we wrap up? I think uh, you know, the informal resolution process is a very good one. And as we say, it, it, historically, there's a lot of small issues that have been let go. And over time, you know, another small issue happens and it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And then you're trying to remember all these other bad things that happened and how were they resolved. And so if you really have a well thought out, well-established plan, and you follow it, it is going to help you in the long run. And I think informal resolutions are a great way for hospitals to start addressing maybe some behavior issues that have been persistent over time. It's an easy starting point that any hospital can take. I agree with you both. I think that's a great place to end. Um, I have enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you guys so much for your time. Um, and we thank everyone listening.
If you have um, more interest in this topic or need more information, we would direct you to um, an AHLA publication of which we all contributed. That is the complete medical staff peer review and hearing guidebook. Oh, there we go, Chris. He's he's holding it up. <laughs> it is. You a all great work resource. so hard on this. It's it's so much <laughs> great information. I agree. It's a wonderful resource. It's a great resource that kind of digs into some of the issues we've discussed today and, and, and many, many more. It's very comprehensive. So we do direct you to that publication for, um, you know, guidance on this topic. So we thank you all for listening. And I thank you, Hayla and Chris. It was great to chat with you thank today. You. you too. Have a great day. Thanks. You too.